Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S.-focused forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. While the pattern has changed, it is now much more of a summer-like pattern for many across the mid and eastern part of the United States. We've got to talk about what that change looks like. What lessons were learned are kind of shown to us over here in the map on the right. This is showing you kind of the composite flow of the atmosphere, looking at the beginning of June through the third week of June. And what it's featured is a highly amplified pattern that started with a trough south of the Aleutian Islands, a big ridge over the West United States that built into a broader trough that was kind of centered right here uh, between the Hudson Bay uh, and the Great Lakes states. Much of this was dominated by high latitude blocking sitting here and stretching all the way back into parts of Siberia and Alaska as well. That same flow pattern brought a deeper trough that sat just off the west coast of Europe. This kept much of Central Europe and, and Western Europe very wet and stormy, especially like in the UK but allowed this ridge to build in here, which brought in the heat and the drier weather to parts of the Russian wheat belt in the Black Sea region. Well, that's where it, the flow pattern was. This is where it is now. As we just look out toward the end of this week, we see now a broader trough sitting off the West Coast. We've been talking about that for several days now in our forecast videos and a ridge building into the midsection of the country. While that's going on, we're changing the flow pattern over here in the part and parts of Europe as well. We've now taken that ridge and shoved it right into Central Europe. That's what's bringing in the heat. And we now have a broader trough sitting over the northern part of the Russian wheat belt. So it's been wetter over the northern part of the Russian wheat belt and cooler, while much of Europe has been baking under this heat. Now, I'm going to cover that in detail in my ag forecast that comes out tomorrow morning, but we're going to focus mainly on the longer term stuff here. I promised you this. Every video that I make, I'm going to show you what our growing degree day anomaly map looks like. We're going to start all of our calculations because I know that we have a, a big U.S. focus, a central U.S. focus in these videos. We're going to start all of them right here on June 1st. So we're looking at the June 1st through present day, what our growing degree day anomaly map looks like. We've had a lot of cloud cover, a lot of rain in the eastern Corn Belt and the Great Lakes states, hence the reason why we're behind. Same thing in this corridor. In fact, we've seen some really chilly temperatures getting back into parts of Colorado and also in the primary uh, where we grow a lot of wheat, primary wheat belts sitting right in through here. If there's any place that's been consistently warm since March, it's going to be down here along the Gulf Coast in the southeast. And throughout the month of June, because the flow of the jet stream was doing this, remember, we brought in some serious heat up into the Pacific Northwest. Well, that pattern is changing. And if we look at the precipitation, we notice that it was very wet in through here as many low pressure systems kind of went racing along that corridor. Very wet, wide open Gulf of Mexico moisture transport, ridge over the northwest. Well, that pattern change looks like this, okay? Now what do we have? Well, the Pacific Ocean is kind of in a funky phase here. Look at this. It kind of builds into a big ridge there, high over low pattern, but this trough is kind of our main story moving forward, all right? Weak flow across much of the United States here, but this trough over the Pacific Northwest has got things in a bit of a different configuration. This is what's allowing for some heat to build into the middle section of the country, while the West Coast, specifically the Pacific Northwest, cools down and actually gets wet at times. This is also bringing a big threat here toward the end of the week for some severe weather in the North Central Plains, getting over into like M Montana and the Canadian prairies. We'll talk about that in the long range forecast. But this is a much different look, and we got to talk about what this means. Let's go temperatures first. When you look over here on the left, this is the next five days. You can see the highly amplified pattern bringing in the much needed heat into a big section of the central and eastern part of the United States. We need this to help this crop get along because remember, we need to treat July of 2019 for those corn and soybean farmers in the midsection of the country. We need to treat it as if it was June. Now, why you've got the cooler than average conditions here is because underneath this ridge is going to be a little cutoff low that sits here. It's going to be in the mid levels of the atmosphere. It's going to keep things wet and stormy in that corridor. Meanwhile, underneath that broader trough, look at how cooler, much cooler things are in the western United States. Well, by day 6 through 10, we still carry the warmer bias here, all right? We still are dealing with that upper level feature sitting here under the ridge, but the pattern is kind of flattening out a little bit. So still cooler, but not as cool as it is right now. All right, in terms of precipitation, let's just take you out for the next 15 days from the European Ensemble on the left and the GFS Ensemble on the right. 
Now, both maps are actually in very, very good agreement, but I want to comment on one thing here. You can see how through on both maps, this region appears dry. Now, when you look at this, I want you to remember that the Gulf of Mexico is not getting shut down with this flow pattern for any sort of sustained time period, which means we will still have daily convective uh, activity in through this area. So the models pick up on that being dry, but there will still be daily thunderstorms underneath the heat and under the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, but it'll be a hit or miss situation. The wetter corridor that's painted in through here is partly due to some northwest flow, but it's also really due to the fact that the change in the flow of the jet stream here is going to allow for that particular region to have more frequent thunderstorm activity moving forward and, and more rain. So we're just trying to see why the models are picking up on this. Now, to, to really sum, summarize this, this is a drier pattern, but it's not a dry pattern. You're going to continue to see, like we saw over the last 24 hours, regions every day that blow up with thunderstorms, okay, in this section of the United States. And that's simply because we are not doing anything to shut down the Gulf of Mexico. The humidity levels are going to stay high, and there's still plenty of moisture in the soil and the lower levels of the atmosphere to use. So yes, you're seeing the maps painted with these, you know, these colors that indicate drier, but you're still going to be seeing quite a bit of thunderstorm activity across much of the United States. That's normal for summer, okay? Now, I, I got to be fully honest with you about the rest of this longer range forecast. I'm going to show you what some of the teleconnections are showing me, but I'm also going to tell you that I'm going to be heavily reliant on the models. Because during summer, the teleconnections, while they still exist, the correlation between them and the flow pattern is weak. So I am not confident my long range forecast. What do we have right now? We have a negative East Pacific oscillation. That's where we have this trough here and a ridge sitting in that area. Sorry, a little ridge sitting there. And so the flow of the jet stream is kind of doing something a bit like this. But I want you to see the flow of these height lines. Do you see them more like this? They're not in these big pronounced ridges like that. What we see is by the time we get out to July the 6th, the flow pattern across the United States flattens a bit. Now remember, this is an ensemble average, but the ridge looks to sit right out here. Now what does all this mean? Well, let me get you to day 15, July 11th. We see that overall the jet stream is kind of doing something like this, but we return back to the dominance of this trough. Now if that trough sits in through this area, we get a lot more zonal flow with maybe even at times some troughing, that sits south of the Hudson Bay going across the northern tier of the United States. The ridge, meanwhile, is parked back here. Now, the consequences of this flow pattern is the warmth that we will be getting in the midsection of the country, you just saw it in this area specifically, is not long lived. It looks as though by the time we get out to the 10th, 11th, 12th of the month, if the models have got this pinned down, and they've been quite consistent about this, this means we go back over toward much more seasonable temperatures and even at times maybe a cooler pattern. Now let me tell you why this is a tough forecast and why I'm struggling with it, just to be honest with you. The Southern Oscillation Index is very negative. This is telling me what El Nino is doing right now. And it's been diving down toward these negative values for the last two weeks. Normally when that happens, that tends to give us a stronger subtropical jet stream. And it tends to get, telegraph to me a little bit more about what this pattern should do. But I need to tell you, in the month of July, the correlation between any INSO signal, El Nino signal, and weather across the United States at best is 0.3. It's not 0.7, not 0.9, it's 0.3. And that's not a strong enough correlation where you can really hang your hat on a forecast, which means it's a part of the picture, but it's not a dominant part of the picture. Let me continue with what I mean here. Right now, the Mad Julian oscillation is sitting in its null phase. That means that MJO is not way out, way high uh, amplitude sitting somewhere in that ring I just drew for you there. We are forecasting it to come out either into phase one or phase two. What's interesting is phase one and phase two, depending on where it goes, gives us an entirely different forecast for the middle part of the country, which means because there's such huge spread in the models of where uh, the MJO is going to go, I can't even rely on it as a helper. I can do this. I can see that in the upper levels of the, I'm talking way in the upper levels, we do overall today, getting into this next week and getting into week two, we see the areas that I circled there having, well, kind of the lid removed, good upper level support for convection. And that's why you've got right now 
tropical storm Alvin. Alvin's sitting right here in the East Pacific and it's going to be moving there along the western part of, of, of Mexico. That's because the atmosphere is kind of uncorked and it's letting that happen. Why we're not getting any action in the Atlantic is because we still are suppressing that. And in fact, over the next five days, we're still not seeing much develop in the Atlantic. Strong trade winds across the Atlantic right now, very little uh, wave action, and we've got a lot of Saharan dust. I'll show you that in my video that'll come out tomorrow as well. So we keep coming back, though, to this forecast. I can at least tell you what I've been trained, okay? I, I'm a student of meteorology, and I study what patterns do get us warm and dry during the months of July. What we've got to see is we've got to see some broad troughing here and a big ridge that builds into that section of the United States. We gotta get heat to come up into the, uh, you know, the midsection of the country in there, in toward the Great Lakes. When that happens, we're gonna rely on some higher latitude blocking sitting in this area, such that we get troughing here and troughing there. So if I bring in some heat there, I shove the colder air like this and allow the heat to come up and replace it from the south. And if that's the pattern I need to get to keep this July on the warmer side of things, which is what we need to accumulate the heat in the midsection of the country, well, do I see it? And the answer to that is, with the Pacific Ocean looking like this, the chances are pretty low. Now, if I were to see a map that looks like this, but instead all of this area, look at this, all this area was cool. I had a bunch of cool bias in there. I'd say, whoa, July's gonna get hot and very dry. Instead, I've just got this narrow corridor where it's cool here, and this section in through here has been warming with time. Whenever we see the Pacific Ocean showing us such a warm pattern like this, it's very difficult to have a hot and dry July in the midsection of the United States. That is just the correlation with ocean temperature patterns. So what do we see? We see that by mid-July, July 15th, the jet stream is doing this. Here's that trough feature. See it there? And the ridge is tucked back here. Now that particular pattern keeps it warm in this area inside that wedge I just drew, but near average and at times cooler than average where I'm drawing this line right now. Now when we look at precipitation, remember this, if we end up getting some northwest flow, thunderstorms will extend all through this area, okay? But there is an interesting feature showing up with the models that's coming out of Texas, moving into Arkansas, where we keep picking up on this really wet bias in through this corridor. And if we have northwest flow, this just tells me that much of the United States is probably not going to be moving over to a dry time period anytime soon. It will be drier than what we've seen, but not dry. This is not dry for a thunderstormy type, you know, July pattern. What about going out even farther than that? This is the end of July, much of July 30th. Notice the same thing. Broader trough in this area, see that? Ridge is out here. So if you notice, we keep onto this cooler bias and nobody watching this video that farms corn and soybeans in the midsection of the country wants to see that. That's because we needed the heat in July to get this crop really, really going. And this just gives us that continual worry about the longer range forecast, butting us up against our first frost date without having a fully matured crop. So, you know, we, we all have concern about that. Um, we need to get some nice, clear, sunny days in here to get this going. And I'm just showing you that after we get this 10 day time period where it is going to be warmer than average, the models are really showing me here that maybe this isn't sustained. It looks like toward the end of the month, we go back over into this pattern where we feature more cooler and at times wetter conditions. I'm again, my full confession, I'm relying heavily on the model forecast here. Since I'm doing that, I'll at least tell you this, the longer range models are picking up right now on a warm end of summer and warm fall. Now that's climatologically accurate with the changes we've been seeing, but that would be the best case scenario to be honest with you. We're gonna keep a close eye to see how well they do on that. I'm talking September, October, November here, way out at the end of this forecast. I'm gonna finish with one last map though before we uh, kind of wrap this one up. Something I think is neat to be watching this summer is our vegetative health index. Now, this is a combination of the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and a greenness factor we can see from, from space. When you look at these maps, remember, you're looking for these colors. That indicates very healthy crop from space. On the right, that's June of last year. And on the left, that's June of this year. Now, there's some pretty major differences when you look at these maps, specifically in the South Central Plains. Look at the differences there. Also look at the differences across the Corn Belt and out west. I just wanted to show you this, and I hope you can pause the video and just take a closer look at it and kind of go out there and look in your specific area to see if this kind of lines up with what you what, what, what we're seeing from space. 
But with that overall flow pattern change that we're seeing here, it's going to be very interesting to see how this map evolves in the coming weeks. And I'll definitely be showing you a whole lot more of this because it tells us where across the United States our crops are looking good from outer space. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this forecast video. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions hope you look forward to our next long-range forecast coming out next Wednesday. Have a great end to your week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.